All right, so now as we are progressing through chapter five, we'll focus on section 5.2 um, for this segment as well as the next segment. Um, and f section 5.2 really describes how genes interact with one another and the things that can go wrong with them interacting. So we're now dealing with multiple loci that are working together to determine the phenotype for one specific trait. And so this is um, quite a bit different than the dominance concept where we were just talking about a single loci. Here we're talking about multiple genes on chromosomes and it could be the same chromosome or it could be um, uh, other chromosomes across the genome actually influencing a single phenotype. All right, so um, the way that this section is broke out is um, first talking about gene, or, gene interactions that produce novel or new phenotypes. And then uh, we'll talk in the next segment um, of the online lecture series about gene interactions with respect to epistasis. And so epistatic interactions can actually come in multiple forms. It can be in recessive, dominant, or duplicative recessive forms. And then we'll talk just briefly about complementation. Um, and in the animal breeding world, we actually call this complementarity. And this is where um, the genome actually works to determine whether mutations are at the same locus or at different loci. And then finally, we'll um, end this section of chapter five talking about coat color in dogs. So there's gonna be three different um, online lecture links for section 5.2. All right, so let's first start talking about gene interactions and how they can um, produce a, no a novel phenotypes, or a no novel phenotype, sorry. So genes can exhibit independent assortment um, but don't necessarily act independently in phenotypic expression. So um, if there's more than one gene that's informing a phenotype, they can actually work together um, or against each other, just depending on what the trait is. Um, so the genes that are on one locus may actually have an effect of, of a gene at another locus and this can that effect can be defined multiple ways so it could be working in partnership with it it could be completely covering it up or it could be um, creating some sort of codominant situation all right so the first example that we're going to look at is uh, has to do with fruit color and peppers so there's four different phenotypes that um, can actually occur in peppers there can be a red brown yellow or green color and with respect to the color trait in peppers two separate loci actually work together to define the phenotype so the loci are shown here in blue and in green. Those are the two different loci. So if you have a Y plus at um, one of the first um, alleles on the first loci and a C plus um, at the first allele on the second loci, it doesn't matter what's in that second position, the pepper is gonna be red. So similarly, um, we can see that if we jump down here to the third example, if we get homozygous little y at the first locus and then a big C plus at the, um, at the first allele for the second locus, it doesn't matter what's in this last position here, that pepper is gonna be orange. And then the peach colored um, peppers are going to be, um, the peach colored or brown peppers in this case um, are actually going to um, be a Y plus phenotype with a little c, little c homozygous uh, genotype at the second loci. And then finally, our cream pepper is what we kind of think about as homozygous recessive. So little y, little y on the first locus and little c, little c on the second locus. So this is what this interaction looks like. So if we look at our parent generation and we're crossing a red pe pepper that is homozygous dominant, um, big Y plus on the first locus and C plus on the second locus, and we cross that with a cream plant, 
that is homozygous recessive, then all of our F1 generation is going to be uh, heterozygous and red. So 100% of that F1 generation is going to be heterozygous and red. So then if we allow our F1 generation to intercross with one another where we're um, breeding a heterozygote to another heterozygote, what ends up happening in the F2 generation is we get four different phenotypes. And these four phenotypes um, really split out in the traditional 9331 um, fraction. So this should be familiar to you. So the largest portion is going to be red and they're going to have the genotype um, with the big Y at the first locus and the big C um, for at the first allele at the second locus, sorry. And it doesn't matter what is in the second position for either loci. If they've got a Y plus and a C plus, they're going to be red. Our peach um, color is going to be determined by having a Y plus, and then it doesn't matter what is actually in that second um, position for the first locus. Um, if they have a homozygous little c, little c genotype, then that individual is going to be peach. And then we end up with our orange color, even though it kind of looks a little bit yellow here. And these individuals are going to be homozygous little y. Um, at the first locus and then have a C plus in one position of the second locus. Again, it doesn't matter what's in that um, that fourth position. And then our cream um, color is going to be reflective of our homozygous recessive parent and they're going to have a homozygous recessive phenotype as well, but it's going to be the smallest percentage um, of the F2 generation. All right, so in order to test this theory to try to figure out exactly how many loci we're controlling um, this, the phenotype of pepper color, a test cross was actually performed. So they took the heterozygous individual and then bred it back to a homozygous recessive individual. So that's how you perform a test cross. You take your heterozygous and then breed it back to your uh, homozygous recessive. So the allelic results ended up being um, a ha being half of those individuals had a big Y, little Y, or heterozygous, and half the individuals ended up being homozygous, little Y. And similarly, um, half the individuals on the C locus were heterozygous and half were homozygous recessive. So the genotypic and the phenotypic ratios really played out um, um, qu or, um, quite a bit differently than in the previous um, test. So the again, we've got the genotype um, relating to the phenotype in the chart to the left-hand side. And as you can see, the genotypes have already uh, been defined, what we talked about previously. And then the phenotype um, from this test cross really breaks out over here, so where we end up with a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So we're going to end up with a quarter or 25% of the offspring being red, 25% peach, 25% orange, and 25% cream. So because we get this 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, we know that there are two loci actually feeding into the determination of this phenotype. So that's how a test cross works, is by taking a heterozygote and crossing it back to a homozygous recessive. And if you end up with a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, then you know that you have two different loci that are informing the phenotype. All right, so because that genotypic ratio is going to be the same, that again tells us that those genes are segregating independently during gamete formation, and the phenotypic expression um, is going to be a collective effort from two or more loci, so the Y loci and the C loci. And so again, that's why we get the different phenotypes and how they relate back to the different genotypes. So the Y and the C loci are going to interact with one another to produce a single phenotype. So again, this is multiple loci coming together and interacting 
um, to produce that single phenotype.